All right. Does anybody need a handout sheet? We have handouts that are over here on the music stand. Hopefully um, you picked one of those up on your way in tonight. If I'm stumbling along as I'm reading tonight, I have a contact lens that I cannot see out of. I have two contacts. One is for distance. I can see you in the back. Hi. And the other one's for close up, and that's my reading one. And for whatever reason, it is absolutely clouded up. And all I need is the right one to drive. So, it, yeah, yeah. If I close the right eye, I don't, I don't see anything if I close the right eye. Are you out there? Yeah. So anyway, just bear with me. I'll, uh, yeah, yeah, I took it out before I came, and I thought, well, I'll just soak it in some stuff, and it'll behave, but yeah, well, it must have gotten scratched. Well, let's have a word of prayer here tonight, and uh, it's good to see you this evening. We are uh, lesson number two uh, out of uh, four weeks, and so uh, tonight we'll be talking about uh, the uh, aspects of those who are governed and those who are governing during this millennial kingdom. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for bringing us together tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would be uh, glorified through the study of your word here this evening. We pray, Lord, that you give us insight and wisdom as we study your word. Help us, Father, to admit where we don't have all the answers and help us, Lord, to embrace uh, the truth that we have, uh, the things that we're able to understand and be able to be thankful for, and also, Lord, look at that from the standpoint of how we can apply it to our lives today. So we thank you, Father, for bringing us together tonight. Bless our time, I pray now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last time we were talking about characteristics of the kingdom. That's really the title for this study uh, as a whole. And uh, what we're looking at tonight, it was part of your notes last week, and uh, it began with uh, several characteristics. And on your sheet, it was, uh, and if you don't have that sheet tonight, don't worry about it. You can just write on the back of uh, your, your note sheets that you have today. You can just write and, and alphabetize this. I'll give you A, B, C, D, all the way down to W. Uh, these are particular characteristics so that when we think of the millennial kingdom, uh, the scriptures give us uh, many different characteristics. And so what we're talking about once again, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, there's a little bit of an interlude in the middle here, and we'll talk about the um, we'll talk about those who go into the tribute or the into the Malayo kingdom and so forth. And uh, I'll give you the opportunity there as well to ask some questions. Some of you have had some questions. You've had questions from last week, and I know you just you know you're sitting there going, I just want to know this, and I don't have any idea if I have the answer. But I'll you can ask the question. How's that? <laughs> All right. Uh, so tonight, the, f the first point here that we want to remember is characteristics-wise, this is a characterization of the kingdom, and that is it is characterized by peace. And that is something that is so, so rare, obviously, in the world. But under the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning, uh, we have peace uh, for really the first time uh, in this world. And when you think of what God intended when he first creates the uh, garden and he has Adam and he has Eve there and, and they're going to be fruitful and multiply. The desire was for them to make the right choices and be confirmed in holiness and then peace would have been a byproduct of a right relationship with God. And so when we stop and we consider the aspect of peace, it's very important. We, we can all, almost um, minimalize this in such a way that it's really kind of uh, uh, sensible to us, I think. When we walk with God and we're right with God, we have peace with God, don't we? When there is sin in our life and we don't want to confess it, do we have peace with God? No, we do not. The world lives on the edge of warfare, it, chaos, and turmoil because men and women are not right with God. They're not right with each other either, but they're not right with God. During this period of time, all of those who will be ruling and reigning will be right with God. 
and they will be excellent models of what righteousness is. Jesus Christ will be reigning. He will be providing us the ultimate example. And you will have peace in this world uh, as it's never known before. Remember, when we're talking about the kingdom, we're talking about the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about heaven. But one thing is absolutely true is that when we get to heaven, there will be absolute peace and absolute harmony. So uh, fascinating as it is, uh, peace will be a uh, predominant character, uh, characteristic of this time. So that's wonderful. Imagine having no nations against nations. I mean, isn't that amazing? No nations among nations. There will be absolutely no need for an army at all during the millennial kingdom. There, there's no need for an army. So stop and think about what that looks like. I mean, we have, we have all of uh, the alliances that are lined up in the world, and uh, we try to keep peace through power. We have nuclear warheads. We hope we don't use them, but they're there to keep other people in line. And ultimately, if we had to use them, and that's the view of many, many countries that have those things, and uh, you know, on and on, we, we have such turmoil in the world. And, and it's not going to be the case during the millennial reign of Christ. Isn't that great? I mean, Jesus would say, what do you need that for? <laughs> okay. So, so there's one nation, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a moment uh, more fully. There's joy. That's the second point. Uh, fullness of joy will be a distinctive mark uh, of the age. Can you imagine? Joyous people, people who smile, people who are excited about life. I mean, this is a wonderful, wonderful time to be here on the earth. Now, you start to bring about these characterizations, and you start to get excited even as a Christian. Even though I will be in my glorified body, I'm excited to see what the millennial kingdom is going to look like. I really am. I, I, I mean that. I mean, just to be able to walk down the street. I mean, you know how it is. I mean, you, you walk down the street in New England, nobody says hello to you. It, it's not that they're not tender hearted. It's just that they have other things on their mind and don't want to start a pointless conversation. You go down south and everybody says hello, but you know they really don't care about you at all, right? I mean, they're just like, oh, yeah, hi. It's like, yeah, hi yourself. Whatever. Um, you know, it, it, you, you see it, a, a broad brush, right? Broad brush. Just getting everybody. I'm just trying to get everybody, right? Um, but can you imagine true joy in the hearts of people uh, because there's peace and there's much to be joyous about? So it's really a great characterization. Um, the third point is holiness. The theocratic kingdom will be a holy kingdom and the holiness is manifested through jesus the king of kings and it's important even as we've been studying attributes on sunday morning one of the things we find is that there is only one who is holy that is god and all other holiness comes from god this sunday we're going to talk about the love of god as an attribute god's love that's a wonderful message to be able to bring but stop and think about where does love come from where does love come from? Where does holiness come from? Where does righteousness come from? All of those attributes start with God. <clears throat> and if you did not have God, you wouldn't have any of those other things. Man on his own is never going to be righteous. He's never going to be holy. He doesn't even know what holiness is if he's left to his own self. And so one of the characteristics of the kingdom is holiness because Jesus Christ is that example of holiness. And not only is Jesus Christ displaying holiness, but there are others who are modeling holiness throughout the world as well. So it's a pretty exciting time, right? Would you be holy if you didn't have a sin nature? Mm. Uh-huh. So we'll talk about that more too. Glory, number four, the kingdom will be a glorious kingdom in which the glory of God will find full manifestation. You read about this in John chapter 17 where Jesus says, I wish that they could all behold my glory. I wish they could come up here to heaven and, and just see the glory of God as it's presented in the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. Isn't that amazing? Here you are going to have throughout the millennial kingdom on display the glory of God. What a glorious time. Think back. Think back to the passages in the Old Testament that you, you've read through before where it talks about the glory of the Lord was there. I was just reading through that passage in Numbers 
Sunday and talking about the fact that the glory of the Lord came down around the congregation. The glory of the Lord is substantive. But when the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, left the temple because of the wickedness of God's people, Israel, they didn't even realize that the glory of the Lord had departed because they were so sinful. And, and yet, when the glory of God was there, it was an amazing presence. And so here we have the Shekinah glory. We have the glory of Jesus Christ who will be emanating from the throne in Jerusalem, which is you know pretty, pretty amazing too. So that's, that's an exciting aspect. Comfort. The king will personally minister to every need so that there will be fullness of comfort in that day. Justice. There will be the administration of perfect justice to every single individual. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, we don't have justice today. Um, in fact, in the prophets, you read about uh, the attitude that God has and the concern that he has over injustice. And you see that the heartbeat of God is one that is, is very concerned with the lack of justice during the end times. And uh, Israel went through times before the exile where there was no justice among their people from the leaders uh, who were corrupted, and it, and it emanated throughout the society. And that's one of the contrasts that you have during the Millennial Kingdom where there's absolute justice. And the reason for absolute justice is who's reigning, right? Who, who's in charge? Who's, who's presiding over all these things? So justice will be a part of it. Also, full knowledge. The ministry of the king will bring the subjects of his kingdom into full knowledge. Doubtless there will be an unparalleled teaching ministry during this time of the Holy Spirit. And so people will have a full understanding, something that they really don't have during this time period. Remember how Paul says, um, we see through a glass darkly, but soon it will be face to face. Um, that's a, an amazing passage. But here, you, you don't have that veil. You have Jesus Christ there, and the idea from the passages of Scripture, if you want some, some verses, um, you can look up later. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And also verse 9, it's Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 and verse 9. Also Isaiah 41, and I think that says 19 and 20. And chapter 54, verse 13. And Habakkuk, just H-A-B period, 2.14. Instructions will also mark the kingdom, the letter H. This knowledge will come about through the instruction that comes from the king. And it's just some interesting points here, different passages that talk about information that will be flowing from Jesus Christ. Are you, re are you ready for letter I? Letter I. This is one of the neatest things. Do you remember the original curse that was placed on the earth? Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. We have the sin that has taken place. Adam and Eve, uh, they, they sin against God. And there's my Bible. <laughs> I'm looking around. It's like, whew. I keep telling myself, you got one good eye, just use the good eye. All right. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Adam, to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now this is part of the curse that falls upon Adam. And so prior to the curse, uh, Adam was able to be the husbandman of the uh, fields there and he was able to see tremendous productivity and now that there's a curse we have thorns and thistles and weeds of all sorts aren't there more weeds than are known to, I mean we don't even we haven't even discovered all the weeds that are in the world I saw a weed the other day that was this tall and it had leaves on it like this that's all part of the curse I'll tell you what else is part of the curse it says that Adam will will sweat on his face that's humidity. That's part of the curse. 
Listen, there are times when I'm giving this information that I will give you opinions, all right? And y I'm trusting you to be wise enough to know when there's an opinion and, and, and when Pastor Kevin's actually reading from the Bible, all right? So, so are we on the same page? Are, are, are we okay with that? You know, a little color is good, right? I hate humidity. I think it is part of the curse along with mosquitoes and ticks. I really do. I really believe that. All of those things. You realize that ticks uh, back before the, before the fall, you couldn't find any, first of all, before the fall. God invented them, but they lived someplace else. Um, <laughs> but, but they wouldn't have bitten you. They would have just kind of curled up in your ear and slept there for the night. They'd have been all right, and everything was peace and cool, and, you know, everything was fine. There's peace in the valley. But after the curse, everything begins to change. And so you have this dynamic that has altered uh, the landscape in so many ways. So for Adam and Eve, they knew that there was some serious, serious repercussions because of the decision that they made. There was absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, everything now has changed. Notice there, the, now the man called his wife's name Eve, and uh, what the Lord say to her? Behold, the man's like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now he must stretch out his hand. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drives the man out east of the Garden of Eden. He stations the cherubim there. So there's all of these problems. Now, Eve and, and some of the, the difficulty that she is going to have, uh, just looking there at verse 16, your pain in childbirth, in pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband. So, so we won't get into that today. But as he, there's, there's the problem here of, of several different things that go on. And what we find is that during the kingdom age, there's the removal of the curse. And so this, this has changed. And uh, there's abundant now, abundant productivity in the earth Animal creation will be changed, so their relationship is different. Now, I asked you last week if you could find the passage that says that the lion will lay down with a lamb. Isaiah 11, 6 says what will lay down with the what? The leopard will lie down with the with the young goat. Idea being is that young goats taste good. Don't they? Have you ever had a young goat? Ha! Huh. Wow. Last time I was in the Middle East, I had goat's milk. <laughs> anyway, it was terrible. Uh, <laughs> never drink a milkshake at a road stop sh stand in Beersheba where it's 115 degrees and they haven't seen a refrigerator in 100,000 years. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. All right. So a leopard will lie down with the young goat. What's the other passage say? The calf and the lion. What, what else? The wolf. Yeah, the wolf and the lamb are what's connected. Not the lion and the lamb. It's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, the church um, that I was in before I came here, uh, had a beautiful stained glass. They only had one piece of stained glass in that whole church. They put it up behind the pulpit all the way up top there. And it was this beautiful thing. And one Sunday morning, I said, you know, we're talking about the integrity of studying God's word and, and making sure that we're following. I said, you know, right here in this auditorium, we're off. And everybody looked at me like, what? And I said, yeah. I said, look at that stained glass. I said, it has a picture of the lion laying down with the lamb. I said, see if you can find that in your Bible. <laughs> There's just something that's more, you know, uh, articulated better because, you know, an L and an L sounds way better than a wolf and an L, right? A wolf and a lamb. Um, I think the wolf and lamb goes pretty good together. I mean, myself, but that's beside the point, all right? So, <laughs> but the lion's going to walk around. He's going to be grazing, okay? I mean, this is like purring and nice and everything's going to be changed. Think of the significances of this, and we'll get into this a little bit more. But there are a lot of significances associated with the removal of the curse. A lot of them. Separating the sheep and the goats. You mean, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I think... 
I think any lion, leopard, wolf would love to eat a sheep or a young goat any time of the day. Or an old goat. <laughs> uh, but during this period of time, uh, there's going to be uh, a harmony. Think of the, think of the repercussions. We'll, we'll stop here right now just because we're here. And who knows? You never know if you'll ever get back. Um, what are some of the repercussions of having the curse lifted? I want you to think about it. What's that? Endless reproduction. Not only in animals, right? But people. People. W there's, no pain in, there's no pain in childbirth. How many of you women, I'm just asking, just, you know, just, just asking. If there was no pain in childbirth, how many of you would have had more children? Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would be like if, as the Bible talks about, a child will be considered a child at 100 years of age? So the whole time frame of life also changes. So you're bearing children into your 200s. Pretty cool, right? I mean, wow, these are my 133 kids. <laughs> you know, we're going to have a party this week, <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. We're going to look great. We're going to look great. I mean, right now at the age of 30, the elasticity in your skin begins to fall apart at the age of 30. I learned that physiology class when I was in high school, and I figured 30 is so far away. I don't have anything to worry about. Um, but I passed it a little while ago. Um, I, y you're going to be so totally different. Well, what else is impacted? Mm -hmm. It's an editorial we. So, so because we're in glorified bodies, um, we'll witness all of these things. But uh, we, will, we will not be having children um, uh, and all of that. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and there's, yeah, the, yeah. Work will be enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. It will not be a burden to the people uh, as they go to work. They'll look forward to it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think world population will go through the roof um, and it'd be much greater than it is now. Weather, that's a good one. Didn't really think of that, but that's absolutely true. Um, yeah. Now, here's a question for you, because you like to fish. Do you think you'll be killing fish during the uh, Millennial Kingdom if you're part of that group of people? So you're definitely not going to hunt. I mean, who's going to walk up and just shoot something that's sitting there purring? And if you and if you and if you did that, you would be in a world of trouble. <laughs> yes. Did everybody hear that question? So, so here's my question to that question. During the time previous to the fall, was Adam and Eve, because you're right, they're going to continue on the work that Adam and Eve did pre-fall. But was Adam a hunter before the fall? Stop and think about what happens when the sin takes place and they find themselves naked. So the first sacrifice, blood is shed to cover their nakedness, i.e. their newfound sin, as a consequence. But there's never anything written that would give us the idea that animals would be killed 
prior to the fall. After the fall, animals are now afraid of man. They are predatory towards man, and man struggles to have dominion over them. In fact, there are some animals that we still don't have dominion over, right? I mean, like our old Labrador retriever. <laughs> I think it drives me crazy. Now, I mean, there are some things that just don't obey us. <laughs> I mean, plain, pure, and simple, right? Um, you know, do we have have we been able to accomplish what God wanted us to accomplish? And that that is one of the main questions because as you go through and you look at these passages with the millennial kingdom in mind, what you're seeing is you're seeing God putting things back to how He originally intended it to be. And it's it's fascinating to watch how all these components come back together. Uh, but I don't I, I don't see where. The, the animals were anything more than entertainment for man uh, before the, the fall. So. <sighs> right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's amazing how much um, there's a lot of things that we like to do here today that we would never have done had there been not a fall into sin. But we would have been doing things that were productive, things that were not painful, con having simple consequences. And there is much to rejoice about um, because of that, I don't think we fully can grasp how wonderful the Garden of Eden was. Um, but I think that during the period of time uh, of these thousand years, man will have man will have such great joy as, as we just looked at that joy aspect um, that 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 really the, the other stuff really doesn't compare to it. Um, it. It's just very very limited. I think when you look at uh, life itself, for instance, and, and we, look at, we, we look at how short, for instance, our lives are and uh, the time spans that we have to live, and, and yet during the Millennial Kingdom, people will live for hundreds of years. You know, it's going to be uh, totally different. And so the, the pain of death and the sting of death, uh, even though they'll be in mortal bodies, they will not experience, you know, that type of hardship. Um, and I think that's there's a there's a wonderful component to that. Um, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Right, and and we'll talk about that here in a little bit uh, because that is uh, the witness of of for Christ actually flows from Jerusalem and the Jewish people are actually uh, to be witnesses to the rest of the world. Uh, so I think that when you, you look at the number of people, I don't know how many are going to be Jewish and how many are going to be Gentiles. Uh, it's pretty, pretty difficult, you know, to know. Uh, but there's definitely evangelism that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. 